This time on Whatever We Want, we talk about the Kenobi trailer and also turning red from Pixar. Yeah, we break down the Kenobi trailer predictions, Easter eggs you might have missed, like some stuff with the Grand Inquisitors and like their history. And then we also mm -hmm. talk about turning red, some filmmaking techniques, mm -hmm. um, the cultural influences of the director from her um, Asian Canadian background. Color theory. Yeah, all that and more. Enjoy. Yeah. Daniel, happy St. Patrick's Day week. Happy St. Patrick's Day week. St. Patrick's Day <laughs> fell on like Thursday and our podcast comes out on Monday. So I was like, should I make it this Monday or next Monday? And I was like, you know what? This Monday because people might watch it on St. Patrick's Day. So for those of you watching on our YouTube channel, we've got all St. Patrick's gear going up. Mm -hmm. I feel like Cad mm -hmm. Bane with like this visor <laughs> that I've got going on. <laughs> I also... Um, bought these sunglasses, but they are so tall that like the hat, like yeah, the, like it looks just down turns your on whole it. rim up. Yeah, yeah. So I might not wear those, but I have them. <laughs> Daniel's got his fedora and this amazing necklace that is gonna yeah. distract me the whole time. <laughs> what can I say? I'm the lucky one. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. So I've been seeing Patrick's Day, everyone. It's ironic because. As we talked about in the intro, we're talking about turning red, but everything that we have on right now is green. <laughs> and Dude's got some well, green Pringles. <laughs> well, actually, there's a lot of good color theory in the movie, which we can get into. Ooh, let's let's do yeah. that in a bit. Are you ready to jump in the intro and we can get into the topics of the week? Yeah, hit me with it. All right, I'm doing like the, the old kind of hybrid intro, so. Okay, yeah, 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 Welcome back to whatever you want, where we review content across all mediums of media, movies, TV shows, video games, and beyond to give you the most interesting behind the scenes insights, storytelling techniques, all that jazz, and more. Everything on screen has a purpose, and it's our job to try to figure out why. Yeah, Daniel, remember. <laughs> so yeah, like Star Wars, Marvel, Pixar, Disney, all that. Um, so without further ado, let's jump into things. Um, so yeah, Woo! first we're talking about Kenobi. Kenobi! Yeah. Kenobi trailer dropped. Oh my goodness. It's also kind of ironic because, again, like Darth Maul's like all like red. And like <laughs> we're we're green yeah it's, we're it's like Yoda kind of like... we're repping Yoda the good guys you know <laughs> I'm so excited for this show it's so great May like 25th if it doesn't get delayed I think that's actually gonna be our 100th episode is like our first episode covering Kenobi so yeah that should be interesting we've got some ideas for that if you have any ideas what we should do for our 100th episode like let us know but yeah so do you have any just like overall thoughts or things that like stood out to you that you either really liked or didn't like? Okay, everything was amazing just off the rip. The only the one and only thing that I did not like was the design of the Grand Inquisitor. Yeah, because we've seen it. We've seen his his species before. Was it like Poan or something like that? Whatever they're called. I don't know. Or, I'm watching through Rebels again or for the um, first time slash again kind of. Well, no, I've we've seen, seen that species in. I mean, not only like across media, but like we've seen them in. I believe it was in the prequels. And the, there's a yeah. member of it in the Senate. And then at the same time, um, what was it? And Clone Wars. Yeah, Clone Wars and Jedi Fallen Order. Yeah. So it's it's really interesting. The Grand Inquisitor, I was doing some research, and he actually used to be, what we found out like in one of the series, that he used to be one of the Jedi Temple guards that actually yep. like arrested Ahsoka when she was like wrongly accused for um, like betraying the Jedi Order. He like was good and like dedicated his life to like guarding the temple. I, I, it kind of makes sense why he would go evil. Like, he goes through the same Jedi training as, like, all the rest of the Jedi, and then they're like, you're gonna be a guard and do nothing fun. I'd be like, you know what? Screw that. I'm gonna be a Sith now. <laughs> <laughs> but it also sucks because... Yeah, no, that was a good point. He, like, went to the dark side and isn't even, like, a full Sith. But hey, at least he gets to live. I mean, think about it. Like, you're there and you're, like, seeing all the other Jedi, like... Yeah. Get slaughtered. Escape change teams. I'm not <laughs> down for that. <laughs> so, in the show, like, in, in Star Wars Rebels, the Grand Inquisitor was played by Jason Isaacs, who's actually the guy that plays Lucius Malfoy, like Draco's dad in oh. the in Harry Potter. So he has like a really like menacing, like haunting voice. Voice. Um, yeah, that but, voice is epic. But in Kenobi, he's not played by him anymore. He's played by Rupert Friend, I think, who's someone else. So I don't know if he has like more of a stunt background or something. Rupert Friend, like one of the friendliest <laughs> names. <that they're... laughs> and he's hunting down... You and McGregor, no. <laughs> oh, no. We also see Uncle Owen in there, who's played by the same actor that, yes. that was in episode three. I didn't make that connection at first. I was like, wow, they got someone who looks exactly like him. And I was like, oh, wait, like, because I, I, I was like, him. I was like, wait a minute, like, you and McGregor also aged up from episode three, like, mm -hmm. almost 20 years ago. It makes sense that Uncle Owen also, <laughs> like, the actor aged up too. He didn't just freeze yeah. in time. <laughs> I think this takes place 10, like, nine or 10. BBY, like I think it's nine before the mm. Battle of Yavin, which is actually like one year, I think, after Solo. So 
Do you think we'll see any of those characters in there? That's interesting. I don't know if we will. I don't think we do, because again, in, in New Hope, right? That's like the first time that they meet up, assuming. That's true. Unless, I mean, but I think Obi-Wan has met Chewbacca, so it would make sense if they... Well, yeah, other than Chewie, but like... They know. could have run into each other. Or like Lando, because like Lando ne- and Obi-Wan never meet after that. That's weird to think about. Yeah, Obi-Wan's never met Lando. Until now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when do you think... Uh, or do you think we'll see... Um, like Cal from Fallen Order and the other Jedi? No, okay, I don't think we will, but I would love to so freaking yeah. much. I, I think wa- they oh should before goodness. he gets to, like, ages out of... Yes, definitely. I guess, they need to well, actually, in. that takes place after episode three, so he could be a few years older now, because this is, like, ten years after that. Wait, yeah, hold on. If this was gonna happen... It would be, like, now. <laughs> no, because he was, like, a youngling oh. when, like, when Order 66 happened. Right, but now that's ten years later. Yep, so he'd be, like, 16, maybe? Or however old Luke is, pretty much. That, like, young Luke. Which, I just got so sad seeing, like, Obi-Wan watching Luke. Like, yeah. And oh, man, dude, that's so sad. I saw he's this like, edit, and it was, like... The parallels of it? Him remembering, like, Anakin, like, pod Anakin. racing, and, like, all mm-hmm. of his good memories with him. And I was like, oh, that hurts the heartstrings a lot. <laughs> yeah. I-, I wonder if we'll see, like, a big part of the show will be, like, Kenobi dealing with kind of, like depression and like his feeling of failure oh, yeah because needs to it, it feels like needs to he's he, he gives that speech he's like we lost like the battle's over and, and like no hope left and like star wars starts in a few years with a new hope like i feel like there's a disconnect and i i wonder if we'll explore his journey like in episode four when we see him as like alec guinness he's like really kind of like jovial and like i'm just a space wizard woo like he, he like feels like more upbeat and, like, in this one, he's, like, so depressed. Maybe he's, like, finally, like, things could turn around. But, like, like in A New Hope, but, like, in, in this, he just seems, like, so down. And, and that's got to be tough. Like, his whole way of life is just gone. And, just like, gone. he feels like it's his fault because of Anakin. I don't know. I don't know the conversations he's, if he's been having any with Qui-Gon. I would love to see. I feel like it needs to be something that shows. Like, his progression. And like, I know. Because, again, Yoda, at the end of episode three, was, like, I still have more training for you. Right, so there's yeah. maybe we'll see that or like yeah, we need. I something. feel like it'd be really good to see that. But in that, I wonder if that's going to bring out the Grand Inquisitor and you know have him come out. Also, at the same time in the comics, we also there's that encounter with like you said before with Black Chrysanthemum where yeah, was it Obi Wan is fighting him to save Owen? I think potentially. I that's what I think we might explore like the rift that comes between Owen Lars and Obi Wan because yeah. like in Episode Four. Owen Lars is like, no, nothing to do with the Jedi, blah, blah, blah. So I think this might lead to that. I, I have some predictions, actually. Yeah. I think the story might go like, so the Inquisitors are, like, so the point of the Inquisitors is that they are hunting Jedi that have, like, escaped Order 66, like, kind of tying up loose ends. They're trained by Darth Vader. Yep. I think that the Inquisitors are going to come to Tatooine chasing someone completely random, not knowing that Obi-Wan is there, like some other Force user, which is, I think, who we see either Force choked or, like, being hung in that one scene uh, in the trailer. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that might be the other Force user or something. Um, And I think this Jedi just accidentally gets too close to, like, Kenobi and Owen Lars, and, like, the Inquisitors can kind of sense, like, there's someone else here. And then Kenobi has to go off-world to lead them away from Luke, which is why we see him in that other world, which is, like, inspired by, like, Hong Kong, according to the creators. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, because, like, it's it's that close if you're getting right onto the planet and right there. Yeah, he needs to get them away from Luke. So it actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I, I really want, I don't know if this will happen now that I th- think about it like that way, but I think it'd be really cool if Kenobi just started like a cold open with like the Inquisitors, like this epic like chase scene, Inquisitors just hunting down like a random Jedi, not one that's connected to Tatooine, but like the Inquisitors um, are like sprinting down and like parkouring and just doing this epic chase and battle with this like formidable Jedi and they just like brutally like murder him murder and then him. like... The Inqu- yeah. so it shows it sets up that the inquisitors are like powerful and to be feared and then it just like rise the jedi like slumps and falls to the ground it like there's a close-up of the inquisitor's face like bathed in the red light of like his lightsaber like oh that'd be so sick that'd be sweet and then they cut to the kenobi title <laughs> 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 that'd be sweet but at the same time if you think about it too like the grand inquisitor he probably recognized obi-wan too yeah yeah so that's also a whole another thing where he's gonna like really not just hide himself with like how much he's using the force but like, right yeah i think he's gonna use blasters more you know it's so uncivilized is it, isn't that something that he does like doesn't he lo- start losing his connection to his force or to the force to try to hide it i'm not sure I if he does that in the comics or maybe not. duel of fates then that came on oh, oh dude 
like remastered ah. oh my gosh I, I and then we get like uh obi-wan just like cutting like some beef or something like that i really mm -hmm. want a montage of like a fun montage of obi-wan just like trying out different normal jobs but like messing up and like nothing fits because like his skill set as a jedi like he can't do anything else so he's like <laughs> he tries to be a butcher and then he tries to be a moisture farmer and he just keeps like failing he tries to be a jawa but he's like too tall and the robes are too small on him or something <laughs> he's like wootini <laughs> uh. he tries to join the tuscans which is why he knows so much about them maybe maybe that's why he knows so much about the tuscan raiders because he says like they're like they're not that precise or whatever he says or like they only travel in straight lines maybe he knows that much about them because he tried to join the tuscan tribe and just True. wasn't accepted like he goes through his own boba arc boba arc yeah <laughs> <laughs> no but that's funny to think about because in obi-wan's early life like this is before faith and menace he was almost not a jedi like he was really yeah because he was technically considered like a failure think about it he was not a knight yet Right, he was still Padawan, but he was almost out of the stage of being like a proper youngling to then become a Padawan. Right, he was like really old relative like, to that. Wait, right? you mean so he was too old? Like in, the in episode Ma one, he was too old to be. A, he was almost too old to be continue being a Padawan. Like he was supposed to get. Yeah. So I, yeah, but then, yeah, but then along then the way he killed he, Maul. Well, no, no. Along the way, bef again, before Phantom Menace, he ran into Qui Gon, right? Um, huh. cause he, he was with the Jedi and all that, but they, they sent him off to like this Agricorp or something like that off world to this one planet. Cause like, again, he wasn't really doing that good of a job as a Jedi. His connection to those, the force wasn't that great, but then somehow his paths cro cross with Krygon. And then from there he was able to take him on as his Padawan. And it's funny cause we all know Obi-Wan's like the poster boy. He's like the ideal yeah. Jedi, you know, that's so it's crazy. Just funny yeah. Think about like, it's a good life lesson. Like. Things might not work out a certain way that you think, but like you never know down the road, like certain things turn out the way they're supposed to. You know, Obi Wan inspiring yeah. millions, <laughs> trillions but across no, it, the galaxy. It, it, it would be funny to see him like kind of like go back to like those roots in a way, and like like understand like again like you're saying like normal jobs like going back to like some kind of like agricorp or like some kind of like uh, yeah, you know, just basic like agriculture or like basic butchery job or something like that, just so he can like get by. Yeah, you know, it'd be funny if he did hit like hit like the force for like party tricks just to like, make money. Yeah, he's like, oh man, I need one quarter I mean, portion. And so uses need... it to to freaking flirt and oh. with Padme, <laughs> like with the pair, floating pair. Yeah, like, true. Apparently that worked somehow. Uh, Honestly, if if someone did that to me and just like floated a pair over me, I think that I'd probably hook up with them too. <laughs> I wanted to ask you what you thought of if like we'll see any of the characters from like Battlefront 2 like the new campaign. So for the new one, she is the daughter of Grand Ma Admiral Versio. Uh, I forget his first name. But okay. And Grand, Ma Admiral, cool. Gra Grand Admiral is just like this high ranking Empire Imperial officer, right? Yeah, like he, like he has his own like specialized destroyer and an entire fleet. That's cool. Right, of, of starships. That's the dream. I'm pretty sure he's also in charge of Project Cinder. It was like the giant space lasers. It was like an entire array of giant space lasers that then that go on and destroy planets. Now, that didn't go that didn't go on until later on, like again in the sequels. It could be possible that in the series it'd also be cool to see like the like the starts of those programs. You know yeah. what I mean? Like like seeing them like start to build up these these uh like super like militaristic projects and see like these different characters where they are now and like seeing how they would rank up to then get to those points you know what i mean yeah definitely i'm just super excited fat battle we could see ahsoka potentially even though she'd be a lot younger i don't know how they do that do you think we're gonna be seeing any of the crime syndicate oh like the crimson dawn like with maul yeah i think potentially like again this takes place one year after solo we know spoilers for rebels and like darth maul's story but like he dies a lot closer to episode four so yeah. they could encounter or like the syndicate could encounter because maul at this point is is like still at the, i think top of his game like him and kira are like kind of kicking butt he also might just think kenobi's dead at this point until he goes back and finds them right true maybe i don't know i got i don't remember how rebels goes because i haven't seen it we're watching through it <laughs> yeah all right um uh, before we jump into the next segment i wanted to ask you daniel a deep cutting question are you a bigger fan of star wars or marvel that cuts deep that's like that's like choosing your favorite child it sways whichever <laughs> one i'm talking about or like has stuff coming out right now <laughs> if i'm being honest i like the idea of star wars more yeah okay because it's like, like so abstract and out there and like not in our yeah, universe it's, it's different and it is it's its own fantasy like it's sci-fi but it's also this fantasy where it's it's there's so many different elements to it that is able to... Where, like, Marvel is grounded and is, is also fantasy in a way to where you're able to bring in, like, 
you know, all these different superhero, super powered beings and all that. But, and of course I love Spidey, like beyond all belief, but like, that's tough because it's like, if I had to choose between living in like one universe or the other, right? That wasn't my you know, question. I would be it saying was, Star Wars. What do you think a fan like, of is my question? That's, no, no, no. My point is that that influences my decision. Yeah. You know, like I'd be like, oh, I'd live in, you know, the Star Wars universe because then there's so much higher well, tech. so different I feel like and crazy. Freedom. Yeah, it's so different. Yeah, exactly. So okay, that, that's I think that's my honest answer. Like it's, it's tough, but like I have more of a. I don't even say I have more. They have the same connection to both. It's just tough. But I want to say if I was, but I feel like there's, you also have more chance of just being like a poor like slave because there's so many planets like that. Yeah, but then you also have the chance of a Jedi coming and saving you, and then you starting such out a small like this. this, this, this <laughs> you start you starting out this empire, and like we. It's like <laughs> even less odds than like winning the lottery. <laughs> but there's a chance. So oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. I don't know what my answer is. I, I think as we're talking about Star Wars, I'm so influenced and leading towards Star Wars. And right now, I just love all the Star Wars stuff coming out. But like, if you would ask me like five years ago before all the Mandalorian stuff, I definitely would have said Marvel. But now that like Star Wars is kind of getting better again, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. Are you ready to jump into the next segment where we're talking about? Yes. All right. So we're now going to start talking about uh, turning red. Again, spoilers ahead, like we said in the intro, the new uh, Pixar movie. Again, it's ironic because we're wearing green and it's red, you know? Well, <laughs> is it ironic? Is it ironic? Jake, did you pick up on the color scheme of, like, the friend group and also Tyler? Uh, a little bit. What, what do you mean? What do you mean? Can you explain? So there's there's um, our main character, which, of course, uh, Mei Lee, and she's able to... Mei Mei, yeah. Yeah, Mei Mei. She's able to turn into, like, this giant... Red panda, right? So yes. Obviously, her, her color scheme is like this orange and red. Right. right? I liked her new um, hair better. Hey, look, I'm, I'm repping yeah. that, see? Yeah, you are repping. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but the compliment to that is green, which is her main best friend. Uh-huh. Um, oh, yeah. Then the compliment cover that. And okay. then also at the same time, what was it? Abby and the other chick. Is Abby was, the um, crazy one? I liked Abby a yeah. lot. Abby Dude, is I my like favorite. I, I feel like I'm Abby out of our friend group. <laughs> I just like, like go off and like... <laughs> I just like say random stuff all the time. I'm just like, or we get cut up, you know, just like like random stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, they're like perfect inverse because they're yellow and, and purple, purple, which means they actually have they have a square format for when it comes to the color wheel. Whereas Tyler, interesting, Tyler is blue, right? Right. So if you think about it, if you move over and get to the orange side of the color wheel, the complement to that is then blue, right? So Tyler's like on this outside of the square, but only a little bit off. If you think about right, it, he's sort of adjacent to like Maybelline's, like almost Maybelline? red orange. Maybe What's her name? Maybelline. May May. What? I just know her May May. What's her name? <laughs> her actual. I think I'm pretty sure their last name was Lee. Um, May Lee. Yeah. Her name's May. Is that it? <laughs> yeah, but they call her May May. Okay. Because yeah, it's like a nickname. I'll call yeah. her May May from here on out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what what do you think of just this Pixar film as just a movie in general and then compared to other Pixar movies? Because I think those are two different scales. Yeah, yeah. If I'm being honest, the beginning part, I, like huge disconnect for, for me. Because obviously, like, there's nothing really for me to connect to there. Because I'm not like a... I don't know. I'm not like an Asian girl that's 13 in middle school that's going through... You know, but I think changes. it's just it's about a coming it's like a coming of age story. I think that's very relatable. No, that that's my point. After after getting through like that getting initial over that, like yeah yeah like it's really easy to fall into and then like just really connect with the characters. Like I was saying, like like oh like we were saying like oh yeah I can totally see myself as Abby, you know, and, and like stuff like that. Yeah. You know? In a lot of media, we see like again, there's a lot of male influence in a lot of male characters, right? Uh -huh. Which is unique in this instance where it's you know it's like. A full female cast. This is also the first right. full female, like, led, like, the creatives behind it, all the executives and, like, mm -hmm. like creative leads, um, creative directors, like, were all, it was a whole female team, and that was the first time they are really proud of that. I watched, like, this documentary on, like, the making of it, um, so I thought that was just really interesting. Yeah, and it, and it was a really good job. I mean, again, I, it's, it's something that we don't necessarily think about it, because it's, again, there's so much male influence on media, but, like, after seeing this film and like you get the perspective of what like what it's like on the flip but at the same time still having that connect yeah. with the characters amazing yeah i really liked yeah just i felt like i could, could connect to it a lot just like the being pulled between like two like two different worlds, worlds. almost mm -hmm. um i thought they did that very well the director for this she uh was the director that did bow the, the like short film in front oh, of incredibles really? 2 with like the like the dumpling that like won the oscar 
That's great. Her name is That's funny. Uh, Domi Shi. I thought she did a great job. This was her first feature she ever directed, actually, which I think that's a huge undertaking to do Pixar. But yeah, well, back to my question, though, like, what do you think of it overall as a film? And then what yeah, do you so, think about it compared to Pixar other films? So overall, it was a great film. There's that connection with the characters, but at the same time, it was also realistic in the sense of like the struggle that they or maybe it was like having to do and deal with. Yeah, I thought it was paced pretty well too. Yeah, it was also paced very well. What about compared to other Pixar films? But other Pixar films? Because those are such a that's, high. That's scale the thing. It, it's tough because it's like I mean, you you know about the Pixar story and all that, and it's like mm-hmm. obviously I'm like thinking about that because like every 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 other film has like its like thing, and this one like tries to have its thing with like the whole red panda curse or blessing whatever, and it <laughs> it's like almost there, but it's also at the same time almost too grounded to reality. Okay, you don't think it's as, like, crazy as, like, Wally or, like, a rat cooking or something like that? Yeah, exactly. Like, like those are much more, like... Like, and onward is, like... Playful. It's fantasy and Toy Stories. So you don't think it's, like... Okay, I can see that. You know what I mean? It's, like, more Marvel-esque, right? Like, it's kind of in, like, Like a world where it could be, like... I basically explained this premise, this movie, to my mom. And I was, like, yeah, whenever she gets, like, emotional, like, she turns to this red giant panda. She was, like, so it's Hulk. And I was, like... (laughs) <laughs> I mean, no, kind of. <laughs> but yeah, like I, I think compared to other Pixar films, it wasn't like horrible. Like I think bad Pixar films are like kind of Cars two and yeah. I haven't honestly seen Good Dinosaur yet, but I've heard not great things about that. And I think that's kind of go- Good Dinosaur kind of goes to your thing. Like it's, I think dinosaurs is like a concept is like cool, but there's nothing like crazy unique about that. Like especially since we had Monsters Inc. Like I feel like Monsters Inc. is like yeah, the whole, exactly like, crazy like, beast. Like that's like uh, crazy, and then totally you go to dinosaurs. World. That's like a step down almost because that's kind of even more grounded reality than like monsters. I don't know, but I I can totally, I can totally like see that. Yeah. Well, there's like the Disney 3D films, right? Like, yeah. Again, like like, like, like Tangled, you know, like, Moana, the, like tang- Frozen. Yeah. I'm not. I don't technically include those because those are those. Yeah, no, they're no, their no, own those category. Aren't Pixar. Yeah, that's yeah, not Pixar. Well, that, but still Disney. That's why I was just saying that. But like, just yeah. wanted to clarify because you know a lot of times viewers are just people. Generally, right, right, right. Well, yeah, Pixar is like too. Toy Story, Cars, Incredibles, Ratatouille, Wall-E, um, Testing my knowledge, a bunch of other ones. <laughs> yeah, Up. Oh yeah, I guess Up didn't really have this crazy thing. It was just like a big adventure, I think. Yeah. And it, well, it was a big adventure that had like a lot of like weird things attached to it, and there was like also a lot dogs. of. I guess that's not really grounded yeah. reality. <laughs> but at the same time, it, Up had more of like a sentimental, emotional feel. Yeah, that, the, the emotional impact of it, right? This is more. You can't have that like emotional impact. I mean, you can with this. I think they tried to, do it, and they they did because well. The, I think with the mother yeah, daughter with the story, relationship. That relationship yeah. was really good. Um, but yeah, I just I don't know. I just. I don't think this was marketed great. I honestly didn't. I kept having to remind myself it was like coming out. Um, like I feel like remind light me years, it was out. <laughs> yeah, I feel like Lightyear is honestly getting more hype. I don't know if that's just because like this was just like a Disney Plus release. Like I f- kind of felt the same way with Soul, but I also really liked Soul. Oh yeah, dude, I love Soul. Soul was great. I don't know. Soul, I guess, also wasn't too. I mean, it was like Afterlife and Death. That was kind of that the gimmick of that. Well, um, it, the, the thing that was different with Soul is like. It, Technically, is grounded in an aspect of reality because like a lot of people, you know, have a belief system and have an understanding of like what a soul is. I think we're gonna say a lot of people die. I was like, yeah, most people do that. Yeah, most people do. (laughs) (laughs) Well, no, but like the way that it was conveyed and illustrated, that was the unique thing of it. Um, Yeah, this this I always kind of look for like big visual things because I know Pixar, especially in the early days, they always would try to like improve a new aspect of of technology. Like every time they innovated and like made a new film for like Monsters Inc, it was like the fur on on Sully. They had mm -hmm. never been able to render fur, and that led to being able to do Violet's hair. That was the big innovation in um, Incredibles because they could never do like Mm -hmm. long human hair, Um, and even just the Incredibles being like a full human cast human was like team. never possible yeah. before that's why they did that's why they made toy story was because every time they rendered skin they didn't have the capacity or technology to do it effectively so it always came out looking like plastic so they were like well let's take this disadvantage and make it an advantage to make a movie about toys so i think it's just fascinating in itself but like i didn't feel like there's anything like crazy i don't know i, I had to research more like what the big thing was like the, if they if they even continue to try to do that i don't know if they do but like there wasn't like any like huge spectacle like i feel like the fur was like rendered beautifully. Everything was rendered beautifully. They're at the point yeah. now where everything is like. I feel. I fantastic. feel like the big thing with this one was mixing 
concepts of traditional 2D with uh, yes, 3D. Yes, that was something they said in the documentary, actually, that they tried to do. And they also had a lot of influence from kind of like anime. Yeah. I was, gonna, I was gonna say it's probably a combination of, of anime stylization of like how you get like your you know like obviously like how they drew eyes in some situations and yeah like, like and which fit perfectly for like the scenes like this like thirteen year old girl kind of thing because like yeah exactly like, and they just captured I feel like the essence of being like a, a young kid again so well like your crushes change like every five minutes like the, literally in the beginning she felt like she was like I'm on top of the world nothing can stop me and then like her crush changes and like her world is like falling apart like just that stark contrast like where everything seems like the biggest deal in the world i think was done phenomenally like yeah it was great that is if you are going <laughs> to this movie looking for something like that you will not be disappointed and, and like just the emphasis with like like they whenever she was like oogling over someone like her eyes got huge which mm. we didn't we haven't really seen in like um pixar really i don't think ever so far like it felt very different stylized in that sense, which I think was a lot of really cases. Well also, done. I'm not sure you paid attention to this, but like the tears, whenever yeah. there's like tear effects on the characters, which actually happened quite a bit in this. But what's unique about it is that I'm not sure how they did it. I'm not sure if it was like 2D draw over or if it was like legitimate like 3D like rigging for that. Because uh-huh. like it looked as if it was like 2D in some instances where it was just like like how it would like bevel and like. Then yeah. trickle down in some cases. Like it was, it was weird to see. It was like again things like details like that. And I feel like again, I'm I'm gonna say Spider Verse because Spider Verse is amazing. What they what Sony did with Spider Verse was start a lot of the conversations that's gonna allow for this new kind of stylization to, to move through into the next wave of CGI movies and stuff like that. You yeah, know I mean? and this is like one example of us seeing that. Like we're we're able to get more mixes between like this what's now established like traditional 3D. To how can we push this even more, which is what's awesome about it. That's why I love about it so much. Yeah, I, I really do like, and that kind of reminds me of I don't know if you noticed, like every time she transformed, like transformation effect of like the kind of glittery, like like smoke poof. poof. Yeah, I thought that was done really well. It was like subtle yeah. and like the sound attached to it, like kind of really helped sell the transformation. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And also, I really like she had like the beanie on when she was trying to hide her red hair, and that like yarn looked yarn? amazing. Ah, oh, dude, it was amazing. Oh. It's just amazing how well they've got their like just I don't know what you call it follicle physics. <laughs> yeah, down. I just I think it was a really good story. Like I think the mom and the daughter were the most like kind of dynamic characters. Like the daughter starts out like she doesn't ever blame her mom for like anything, even the, until she, it like builds up and she like kind of has that big blow up but like the mom also never blames the daughter which i think was interesting she's like they both yeah. have this false like screen over them that like neither one of them can do wrong it's about the story is about them like kind of coming to terms that like they're their own people and like the daughter's realizing the mom can is human and can make mistakes and like she doesn't have to just be like a slave to her parents like blindly obedient also mr mr gal the guy that with the sword that does yeah, the ritual he, the duck from yeah he plays mr ping like pose yeah. Dad in uh, Kung Fu and Panda. Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> I recognized the voice. I was like, oh my God. Yeah. Great. I also like this was in like the early 2000s, like 2002 with like the yeah. Tamagotchi reference. That was funny or whatever it is. Is that what it's called? Yeah. yeah. What happens if that thing dies? Like now it's the mom's like, <laughs> it's the mom's like thing holding her. The Tamagotchi is the mom's ritual item that contains her panda. If that thing, like if the Tamagotchi thing dies, will it like unleash or like will her panda die or will she die or like what what does that mean <laughs> maybe we'll get to like a wreck it ralph situation oh that would be cool seeing so like the red panda it just like keeps upgrading it's like jumanji it, like keeps just yeah. evolving <laughs> becomes the game boy <laughs> advance next <laughs> <laughs> honestly i was not expecting the third act to be a giant like godzilla fight i dude. was not expecting that going oh into my this movie. goodness <laughs> dude you know there's moments in movies where you're just like god damn like, for me, when she was like, oh, what's she going to do? Ground me? And then you get just the <laughs> black silhouette of this like, freaking kaiju, like, being walking through the city. That literally got me, like, because, like, the movie was, like, so fun throughout the whole thing. And then I don't know where it's just, like, this, like, ominous dark figure, like, rolling in. And it's just like, god damn, what, what, what's going to happen? <laughs> and then, like, it just ends with, like, the, the boy pan, like, serenading. Like, that was... It was, it was an interesting finale. After that happened, I wrote down, like, what happens to the stadium now? Like, how do they... Did they just get off for that? And then I saw they're like, they're raising money to 
like a million dollars to repay the stadium. And I'm like, ah, how every great movie ends with a family, a million dollars in debt at the end. <laughs> like what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, at least they have their gimmick, you know, so they're able to like that's you know, true get that money back. I, I liked it. I don't think it was the greatest Pixar film, but it was very heartfelt and captured the innocence of being like a young kid, like on the cusp of puberty. I thought like the the adult jokes, like kind of implying like a girl starting her period and like the dad like yeah. slowly backing like, out of the room. I thought yeah. that was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I like the dad too. He had a good some cool moments yeah. at the end. Like came around. Um, that was great. Did he get the little cutscene at the end of the credits? Oh yeah, there was like him, him, yeah, yeah, him yeah, in the dancing. basement. Yeah, yeah, that was funny. Yeah, I, I really do like that we're just getting like more cultural stories from Pixar. Um, yeah, like we got this. We had Coco and Encanto. We just had. I think that was Disney though. But still, we're just getting more and like okay. Soul. But we're getting more like cultural stories. I just, I just think that's really interesting. I do like there's more cultural stories. We need to start getting beyond just the Spanish. If I'm I'm, I'm Puerto Rican, I could say this. Because we, we've dealt with, like, Islanders, which, you know, like, like that's Hawaiian. That's fine. That's, again, Disney. But, like, I feel like we need to get more into, like... What do you want to see next? I mean, that's t- it's tough because, like, a lot of the traditional Disney stuff is based in, like, classic European. You know, like, again, like, I mean, this, Tangled, seeing, Cinderella. This movie was, like, like Asian-Canadian influence. Asian. Yeah, no, that's what I loved about this. This was something that was totally uh-huh. different. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, I'm I'm so happy this movie did take it that direction. I, I feel like there's a lot more. I feel like Disney is, and Pixar are still, like, a big studio. And I feel like there's a huge, like, just, like, Hispanic community that I think that if they are starting to, like, venture into that world, that's the, the logical and safe first bet. And I think after that would be kind of Asian, like, influence because, like like Japanese and anime is huge. Oh god, what was that movie? The one with the two Italian boys that were see, Oh, Luca. See yeah, yeah. Luca. Was that the- That was Italian. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, like that like stuff like that where it's like Yeah, they are starting to get into new that's stuff. That's what I mean. Like like seeing stuff like that I I like like again where it's like literally I mean, going out to like these Soul was like Totally Soul was great. Yeah. Whereas again like like the Americano but also uh like black heritage and like like you know like all the uh-huh. black culture and like how how you're able to again have so much soul um yeah with these hey. characters so <laughs> i'm liking i mean i'm liking this variation yeah here. i'm excited for it i also just it was interesting i watched it again like i said the behind the scenes documentary for how they made turning red but domi she was the first time director um she just seemed like a very fun personality she's very young she's like 33 and this is her first feature she's doing that's awesome yeah she looked like she just tried to make it like a fun and enjoyable experience they've been working on this since like 2018 which i think is when the incredibles 2 came out so i guess like after her short film came out and it won like the oscar they were like yeah you get like a feature that's crazy (laughs) but they also got kind of shut down in the middle with covid um so they tried to do like a coffee time zoom call every week and like Mm -hmm. often like 100 plus people would jump on and it just like seemed like a really like fun tight-knit community that was working on it which seemed just awesome it's nice when you have a lot of people that have that kind of passion and drive and are able to work together yeah i really i want to work on something like that i want to find that same out here i want to um, be able to make that you know make that yeah possess. yeah but yeah so this was like the director's story it was very influenced by her personal journey like she grew up in toronto she like had like a, a parents that were just very like protective but like supported her um and kind of was fine had to find that balance when she was growing up between like honoring her parents and like living her own life Being and exploring own. this new country because I think her parents were like had I think she moved from Directly somewhere from like from somewhere else to like here yeah. to Toronto. Yeah. I know what you said about like like you said it earlier, but like a common complaint I feel like people are gonna have is that people can't relate to a girl going through puberty in two thousand two in Canada. But I, I feel like like we talk about the theme of feeling like you have your life figured out yeah. Like who you are and then some event or some crazy change like kind of shakes that up completely. It's like very common to like retreat and become like shy and it's kind of scary that you like that you think you won't go back to what you used to be like your jovial like happy self and exploring that change is just really interesting. I think done well in this film. Oh, definitely. You might not be able to connect with the character directly, but you're able to connect with what they want to do and like how they want to live their life. You know? Yeah. Like, like their motives are very you know, easy to understand and, and, and relatable. Yeah. I, like, it took a little bit for me to get into that, but then I was like, okay, yeah, you know, I can vibe with this. I can vibe with this. Yeah, also they're kids' movies. Like, they're for kids to have fun, you know? Like, yeah, I, exactly. I wasn't the hugest, biggest fan of Luca, but, like, my baby cousins are, like, big fans of that. And, and I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, it's for kids. Like, I think, I think back so fondly about 
Cars and Monsters Inc., Toy Story, all the early Pixar stuff is because in Ratatouille, because like I grew up with that. Like mm-hmm. I think Ratatouille, Wally era was when I started. Can I? I can start to remember Pixar movies coming out after that, like 2007 to 2010 ish, because I was like yeah. eight to eleven ish. So I think I have to remember that I have that nostalgia attached to it, and I was a kid looking through kids' eyes with that, and now I'm looking at it like a critical eye, which I still love it, but it's just it's just interesting the change as yeah. we grow up and, and like. I don't know, because like I always feel like, uh, like Toy Story was a classic, and I feel like it is a classic, and it was so new, but like th- it wasn't always like around, which just is crazy in my years being here. I don't know. What do the people circa fifteen twenty two do without Toy Story? <laughs> I know. <laughs> that makes me think of like the time traveler memes, where it's like you're the first, you're the first villager I see when I time travel <laughs> back, and you're like. It's like a green screen, but like people put on whatever they want. It's so like some people put on like like really like random stuff, but like in your case, it'd be like Toy Story two. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, speaking of time travel, I actually watched last night. Um, I stayed up really late watching stuff like this, and then I also watched the new Adam Project, the Ryan Reynolds time travel one. Oh, wait, that's out now. Yeah, it also came out yesterday. I was considering talking about that on the podcast, but I was like, we can't watch like so many things. <laughs> uh, but I did, and I really liked it. It was a really <laughs> fun movie, actually. Oh, wait, wait, wait. You said uh, the music. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the music was actually the, so for the, what was it? For Life? The music or, for Turning what? Red. For Life or, hold on, For, for Town, For they? Town. The for music town, for, for town. town and Turning Red. Uh, that was composed by Billie Eilish and her brother, um, I forget his name. B- B- Billy Eilish. But he, Eilish, also Billy, but B I L L Y. No, but he, he's also, he has, uh, He's known throughout the music community. Yeah, I know. He, he have, helped do like a lot of her early stuff. I don't know if he still does. No. Oh, Phineas. Phineas. He does a lot of great stuff, even beyond like just stuff with Billy. Like he does a lot of his own stuff too. Uh, but it was, it was amazing that they were able to work together on this. And they, they were like, it was funny hearing what they were talking about. Like, um, you know, like trying to get into like that early like 90s, 2000s vibe. Yeah, with, like, and that's the, when they grew like, up the too. Teen, so like, they probably yeah, like, exactly. Like, they're drawing a lot of like influence off like what they like. Heard going it up. It kind of but... felt kind of like Backstreet Boys almost. Like, That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I know? could definitely hear that influence. I think it was it was pretty good. It was pretty fun. Yeah. I just love how like they were like, oh, we're going to marry them. And like, oh my gosh, it was just, it was so good. The moment when she started, when May May started going under her bed and started like drawing all those drawings. I yeah. Like, oh my God. What <laughs> and it was heck? like, that was me. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm I, getting there, I No, but you know, there was somebody who did that about me. And I was like, uh, yeah, I know. I also weird. like that. Uh, I don't know what the girl's name is. The one like quiet girl kind of started exploring like that. She might be into to girls a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I think I think one of the like the producer or someone on the show, not the producer, but like maybe the production designer in the documentary, she she's homosexual and she is married to uh, either dating or married. I think she's married to um, another woman and they have kids. So and she like kind of put her influence on that character a little bit, which I thought was done really well. Hmm, cool. Are you ready to jump into the next segment? To E T T T Totally Tubular Trivia Tidbits. Yeah. So did you know in Tangled they had what was called a hot boy meeting, <laughs> hot man no. meeting? Yeah. So. The directors of Tangled, they wanted to make Flynn Rider the most handsome, most attractive male lead Disney has ever made. That was the exact quote. And so they held a large hot man meeting where they gathered about 30 women from across the studio and asked them what they considered attractive in a man. And then they brought in hundreds of images of their favorite male actors and celebrities. And then after like a bunch of deliberation, they like narrowed down Flynn Rider's look to what we see in the movie. <laughs> so that's how we got Flynn Rider. Nope. That makes a lot of sense. My picture was up there. I'm just kidding. <laughs> As I'm dressed just, in this, <laughs> it was me just exactly like this. <laughs> Imagine you doing like a deep fake on the Flynn Rider. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so it's literally just your face on him. Oh my God. Yeah. All right. Are you ready for a patron shout outs? Yes. Cue the Epic Stars music. Boosh. We got patron Lori, Frank, Rick, Lisa, Evan, Tony. Thank you so much for watching the tier. They can see the shout out. If you like to support us over on Patreon, the link is down in the description. You get the audio episode early, special benefits, cool perks. All that jazz and more. Roll in the Discord. We sometimes talk to you guys. Yeah, thank you so much, seriously, to our patron supporters. We really do appreciate it. Wait, I do have a tidbit. This is kind of recent, and this is more of a game, but it also kind of is film. So a big update just came out to Destiny 2. I know there's a lot of people who might game in our community, but there's this one mission where you're going to, like, this this uh, swamp, and there's an, actually a Star Wars reference in there. They have, like, this little creature that, like, has this little eye that pops up, and it looks... A lot like the creature that's within oh, yeah. uh, the trash compactor of In the, New Hope. you know, yeah. So I thought it was funny that, that they had that as a reference that 
was just in the game because Destiny and, and Bungie chose a lot of experience, you know, from like previous work that they did with Halo, but also obviously like Star Wars and graphic novels like Dune and stuff like that. So it was just cool to see like little tidbits like that. Yeah. All right. I do have a comment though. So if you'd like to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or a comment on our YouTube channel, we will shout them out in this section here. Yeah, actually. So Brandon, uh, Brandon Swafford, the guy we interviewed that worked on What If, great guy, but he commented on our Batman review and he said, great episode, guys. I really enjoyed the Batman. It's a movie with an aftertaste, which I, I think that's a good, yeah, good that's description good of it. it. Yeah. I haven't heard like that, but yeah, I like that. So thank you, Brandon. Appreciate it. All right. Ready for the introduction? Yep. Tell my way in. When? We just talked about what we want to talk about, and now we're done. Thank you so, so much for listening. Seriously, really genuinely appreciate it. Um, next time, I think we have another episode from someone we interviewed before we shifted kind of back to doing reviews. I think it's it's a little bit of an interesting episode. I don't know if there's video for it, uh, but it's a, he's a really cool guy. He is like the head of a visual effects studio in London that like worked on Dune and actually worked on Batman. So yeah, I think that's going to be next week if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, so I'll have to do some fancy editing for that. But yeah, we'll figure it out. Thanks again for the support. Happy St. Patrick's Day and see you next time. Goodbye. Bye.